Talk more now. <laughs> well, it was way back in the last century, about 1979 or so, when I moved to Arizona and I had this opportunity to learn how to do some technical rock climbing. My mother thought it would be a great thing for me to do because I was being a little mopey. Um, we had just moved from New York and I'd left all my friends back there and I was being a little mopey, probably was. So I went uh, with the Arizona Mountaineering Club and learned how to rock climb, safe way and all of this. I had some nice experiences. But the one thing that I wanted to experience was to do the lead climb. That is, if you are the person that goes up first, because if you're the person that goes up second, it's really easy because, well, not easy. Sometimes you have to pull the stuff out, the, 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 not the pitons, but the chops and, and things like that, that, that the rope goes through. And those things are there to protect you in case you fall. Now, if you're on a second or a third going up and you're being belayed by somebody on top, you only fall maybe a couple inches or so, whatever the slack in the rope is. And hopefully there's not that much slack. <laughs> but I decided I wanted to be the first one up. That means I had to find a route to go and all this. And so they, they led a class and that, and it took us out to, it was a place called the Boulders as a matter of fact. It's a now a nice resort. You can go there and you can see the wall where climbers used to climb. They don't let you climb there anymore. But, so I was, uh, learned some techniques and all that and it was ready for that day. And uh, people were picking out their routes and I wish I'd picked a crack to go up, but some had already gotten that one. And so I had this nice smooth surface, surface to go up. And uh, I had my move chocks, and these were little things that you stick in cracks, and you pull, yank very hard to make sure that the rock doesn't break. And then you put your carabiner through, and then you pull up the rope, and bingo, you're protected for a short time. So I went up about 25 feet before I could find this little tiny crack, a little tiny crack. And I was hoping, beyond all hope, that that crack could sustain me in case I decided to fall. <laughs> So I had to get the smallest stopper that I could find, I put it there, yanked it in there, put the carabiner, got the rope up, and then I began to look. And I could see where my next point needed to go because there were no more cracks. There was what they called hangers, and these were bolted into the side of the rock. All I had to do is get up there, clip in the carabiner, put in the rope, and I would be set. I was probably about five feet away from it when all of a sudden things went south. <laughs> I started to get tired. I probably wasn't wearing the best boots. I learned later I should have been wearing tennis shoes, but I had these combat boots that I was wearing. <laughs> Not very good on smooth rock. So as I was trying to figure out what to do, I slipped. And I was hanging by my fingertips. Now I had already gone up about 10 feet or so from where my last piece of protection is. When you're lead climbing, it's not the slack that's in the rope, but you're gonna fall twice the distance of the rope from where uh, you would put in your piece of protection. So I was looking at probably about a 20 foot fall. That's if the protection held. I wasn't sure it was gonna hold. So as I, what seemed like an eternity and thinking how long will I be able to hold by my fingertips, I realized it wasn't gonna be long at all. So I just decided to let go. And I slid down the rock and then slid and kept going and bouncing, and then boom! I could hear the sound and the clinking of a carabiner, and I'm floating around, and lo and behold, it held. And also the person who was holding, he held too. So I didn't have to, what we call bottom out, that is to hit the very bottom where there was cactus and sharp rocks. So all that story is to say is that the amount of trust that I had to place in the equipment, in the rope, I had to place trust in the rope, I had to place trust in the carabiner, I had to put trust in the, um, the actual piece of protection we call it, the stopper. But I also had to place trust in the person who is the belayer, that is he's the one that leads out the rope, to make sure that if I did fall, he would immediately tighten so that I would only fall 20 feet instead of 40 feet. Trust is an important thing in our lives, I believe. You don't have to be a rock climber or anything like that to know that we trust implicitly on some things. Imagine, you know, we all drive cars, I'm sure, right? 
Don't we trust that other drivers will behave? <laughs> that they will stop at stoplights? That they will stop at stop signs? Don't we trust drivers that, you know, they're in the other lane and oncoming, that they will stay in their lane and not come in our lane? So that's a, an example of trust that, that we, we do. But think about now, I think we would all agree that our political climate right now is very polarizing, right? We have to trust the news that we receive. Is it really news or is it, quote, fake news? We have to trust in that. In our story of, of Naaman today, we discovered that we have a top-notch Syrian general. Aram is another name for Syria. We know that Israel and Syria, even today like then, border against each other. And in the ancient world, it seems like just like today that armies from other nations like to go into other nations and take things that don't belong to them and bring it back. It was no different back then. It did say in the first part of the scripture that that the Lord had given Nahum victory over the Israelites. Now, the Israelites will think, well, that's because we were bad. That's why God let that happen. But nevertheless, Nahum was a, a top-notch Syrian general with a skin condition. Now, the scriptures always talk about leprosy. We don't know if it was really leprosy because the general word is for leprosy, but it could be for a variety of skin diseases. But I'm sure that it was very embarrassing for Naaman. You know, imagine he's coming back from a campaign against either Israel or some other nation. You would imagine they throw him a ticker tape parade. Yay, Naaman, general, he's done it again. He's brought us all this kind of loot and bounty and, and more slaves. But he can't be in the parade because he's got this skin disease. He's too embarrassed about it. He doesn't want to give it to anyone else, so he has to go home and sulk. Everybody else is having a good time, and he has to sulk. Now, as we heard in the story, he gets this idea now from a slave girl. Now, this is a girl who was captured in one of the Syrian raids of Israel. So she's from Israel, and she knows about the prophets of Israel. She knows a, a particular prophet in Samaria. That's another name for the northern kingdom of Israel. And so she tells the mistress. He says, look, there's this guy there that could probably help your husband. Just tell him to go. And of course, we know that men usually don't listen the first time, and you have to take a long time to try to hear what's going on, right? <laughs> so he had finally agrees, and he has to go to his king, get permission, gets his visa, goes to Israel. He has all these wonderful gifts to take. He probably takes a small company of men. And lo and behold, I can imagine the Israeli scouts are looking over the hills. They see this top-notch Syrian general with these soldiers and all these gifts, and they're wondering, what the heck is going on? Is this another invasion? Well, he doesn't attack. Instead, he goes to the king of Israel. He presents the letter from his own king and says, here, king, this is my top-notch general, Naaman. He's got leprosy. Cure him. And of course, this is one of the funniest parts of scripture I think there ever is in the Old Testament. Well, one of them. That the king of Israel says, wait a minute, I'm not God. I can't do something like this. This is, this is a pretext. You're going to attack right now, aren't you? <laughs> but that's not the case. And of course, the king of Israel, like most of us do when we're worried, we, we shred our clothes and just think and pray to God saying, help me in this moment which God does, right? Because the prophet Elisha hears about that the king has rent his clothes, that the general is there in need of some healing. Come on down to my house. And there you find it. And there you have the healing. And so the company of soldiers goes down. And the general is thinking, well, I'll finally get to meet this prophet. But does he get to meet the prophet? No. So this is number one insult to Naaman. Number one, he doesn't get to meet the named guy who's going to do the healing. The number two insult is about to happen when the servant comes forward of Elisha and says, okay, this is what you have to do. Go to the Jordan River and get in it three, seven times. Get in, come out, get in, you know, and by the seventh time, you will be healed. Now, this is an insult too. Because as he says, and you heard, there are rivers in Damascus. Why couldn't I go there? Why couldn't I go there? 
And of course, he has one of his faithful aides comes to him like most top-notch generals do, tries to assuage him, calm him down, and say, no, look, I know, Naaman, that if he had given you a challenge, like go kill a lion or go attack an enemy of Israel and, and bring back the bounty there and lay it before the king, that you would do it. You're that kind of guy. You're macho. Look, all he says is take a bath. <laughs> What's wrong with that? Take a bath. So eventually, Nahum relents, goes to the river Jordan, does exactly what, and lo and behold, he's healed. Lo and behold, he's healed. Later on in scripture, at the end of this chapter or so, Nahum praises the God of Israel, and he actually asks if he can take some dirt from Israel so that he can take it home and put it in his backyard so that he can uh, have time to worship God in addition to the gods of Syria. How about that? Sweet of him, right? Well, friends, certainly this story about is that God is better, okay? The God of Israel is better than all the other gods. That's certainly what, what the writer wants us to know, right? Because Nahum couldn't get healed in his own land, but he comes to Israel, bingo, our God can do it, right? So, but it's also a story of trust, a story of trust. And Naaman has to do trusting three times. This is what the Reverend Nesslin Cowan writes. He says, Nahum is putting his trust in, quote, the other. Whether it is the religious ethnic other in, in trusting that young female Israelite captive, who, by the way, in society is a nobody, right? She's a nobody. Or Elisha, the prophet, quote, of the other land, and religion, but Naaman puts his trust in them, and then even when Naaman's trust runs dry upon receiving, when he gets that ridiculous advice to jump in the river of Jordan, um, he trusts his servants, who were others as well, because if they're servants, they too are part of society that aren't as up there with, with Naaman. So by trusting, quote, the other, in all three instances, this is how Nahum is healed. And perhaps this is what God wanted after all, to, to help Nahum to learn how to see others differently. That they're not just slaves, they're not just people in lower parts of society, but they're just as worth a person as you are, as you are. Cohen also writes this, he says, he says, this is a story of trusting in God and trusting in others, but trust is an inheritance from God. God has entrusted us with the stewardship of the world and everything in that world from the natural realm to our relationships with one another. In turn, we are called to trust God in word and in deed. That we can trust God that God is continually in love with us. No matter who we are, what part of society we come from, what other, I don't know, socioeconomic background we're from, what, that we are loved by God. God loves everyone. So our take in this story is that we have to continually have trust among ourselves, right? in this community of faith, of Boulder City United Methodist Church. Because if we don't have this trust in one another, people outside these walls will know. They'll know, believe me. Some people outside these walls will find any excuse they can to bring a spot of blame on the church of Jesus. It's sad to say. And sometimes we give them the ammunition to do it. There's no doubt in my mind. But if we can trust ourselves, trust each and every one here in this room, and perhaps those who have the Navy here this Sunday, it's a good start. It's a good start. Because, friends, I'm sure we are in daily encounters of people who are like Naaman, who have something going on in their lives that they need help with. It might be a 
a physical thing. It might be a spiritual thing. It might be an emotional thing. But they're like a man, and they're looking for hope in their lives. And they're looking to find a way to help, to find help for their lives. And you know who we are in the story? We're the slave girl. We're the slave girl. We are the ones that know who that person can go to, right? Jesus, right? That we can tell the story that we know of someone and we can share our own experiences of Jesus, right? Because if we didn't have experiences, I doubt you'd be sitting in front of me right now listening to me talk about Jesus. But we have experiences that we can share with people that they too can now find hope and healing in their lives. In Luke chapter 4, verse 27, I believe it is. Remember Jesus goes to Nazareth and he goes to the synagogue and he opens the scroll and reads from Isaiah and then he rolls it up and he says, in your hearing, uh, and this is the, the words of Isaiah that this is the year of the Jubilee. I've been anointed to, to uh, share the spirit of the Lord among all the people and all this. And it's a wonderful text from Isaiah. And then Jesus says, in, in your hearing, this has been fulfilled. And the people get upset. Because Jesus also talks about, do you remember that of all the lepers that might have been in Israel, who gets healed? It's an outsider. It's an outsider. So Jesus is telling that congregation, the people in the together, I say, look, I'm not just here for you. I'm here for everybody. 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 So this is our task now, to show that this church is for everybody. Everybody. No matter who you are, what you've done, whether you think the way I do or not, whether you're a skeptic, the church is for everybody. And I hope that you will go out this week and begin to think about that and how you can be like that slave girl to a name in the June calendar. Amen.